Okay, section 10.2, goodness of fit tests. Let's look at one final example. In 2013, the Mythbusters investigated whether bathroom stalls were used equally or if people preferred some stall locations over others. To test this, they put counting devices on the bathroom stall doors in a public restroom that had four stalls. They numbered the stalls from one to four, with stall one closest to the door and stall four or the furthest from the door. The counts from their sample of 119 uses are shown below. And having watched the episode, I'll just add a little bit more to this. Um, this bathroom was in a location where there was never like a long line where people would just take whatever was next available. Generally, things were probably going to be where they could walk in, all four would be open, and they would make their choice. Does the data provide enough evidence at the 5% significance level to show that the true distribution of the use of the stalls is something other than uniform? So when they talk about significance level, I know that it's going to be a hypothesis test. It's a hypothesis test about the use of the stalls, and there's four different categories. So when we're looking at how things are spread out over four categories, that sounds like a distribution type of question, and they even mention the true distribution. Those are all indications of a goodness of fit test. So with the goodness of fit test, we're going to start out with step one, would be to write H0 and H1. And remember that for this type of test, we write that out in words rather than symbols. Well, this last piece of their question, the distribution of the use of the stalls is something other than uniform. If I get rid of that question mark and make that a sentence, that's either H0 or H1. And when I look at this and try and decide which it is, when it says it's something other than, you could substitute the word different there and it would mean the same thing. So the true distribution of the use of the stalls is different than uniform. And when you're trying to decide is that H0 or H1, to be H0, this phrase would have to be one that has the idea of equality contained in it. And this sounds more like is not equal to than is equal to. So this statement right here is going to be H1. So I'll copy that down here. Alright, now when I go to write H0, I want to take that part is something other, which sound like is different from, and I want to substitute the idea of equality there. So I think it would be good if I said the distribution of the use of the stalls is uniform, and get rid of that is something other than, and just say is uniform. So let me go ahead and replace that. It doesn't look like that will all fit in the line, and one of the things I don't mind you doing on this is just kind of saying dot dot dot, and then saying stalls is uniform and just show what's different about the sentence so kind of that idea that like hey it's it's all the same at the beginning but then it says is uniform instead of is something other than so as long as you write one of these out for me completely I don't mind if you do the dot 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 on part of the other one to shorten it up a little bit and then step two would be to decide on a significance level and they said we're going to do this test at the five percent significance level so I'd write down that alpha is 0.05 and that finishes the setup phase of the hypothesis test. So at this point, we'd want to start into our test statistic. And when we do the test statistic, we're going to make a table. So the different things that we would want in that table, one of them would be the category, which would be stall number. And so in this situation, they have the choice of stall one, two, three, or four. And then I would want to get my observed and expected frequencies. So remember that when we do the O, that stands for observed frequency. And those observed frequencies will always come from the sample data. So if we look up there, it says that they took a sample of 119 uses and they got these frequencies. So that since these came from the sample, that means these are values of O. So I'll fill those in. 23 uses for stall 1, 38 for stall 2, 34 for stall 3, and 24 uses for stall 4. One of the things that I would also suggest when you're filling out the table and you get your values of O 
is that you add them up real quick on the calculator and just make sure you get the 119. So I'll do that real quick. 23 plus 38 plus 34 plus 24 gives me the 119 that it's supposed to, just to make sure everything's adding up to the sample size they said I was going to get. And then I want to go on to E. I'm actually going to leave a space here, and you'll see why in just a moment. But when we do E, which stands for expected frequencies, I told you that we should take N times PI, where PI is the probability of success for each one of these categories. And when you think about, well, what would you put there? Sometimes people are tempted to take 23 over 119 or something to use the percentages. Uh, but that's not quite correct. When you think about E, it stands for the expected frequency, but the more full phrase there is it stands for the frequency we would expect to see if H0 is a true claim. So we want to think what would the value of E be for these four stalls if the distribution of the use was uniform. And so what is uniform? It's that kind of flat everything's the same height sort of curve. And so what that means in terms of the values of PI is that they would all be the same. So for the different values of PI, P1, P2, P3, P4, if it's uniform, you take the 100% and you divide it into the four categories equally, and that means there'd be a 25% chance of use on each one of these if it was uniform. Again, uniform means everything has the same height, and in this case that would mean everything has the same probability. Now your values of PI, if you want to do the check on your work there, should add up to 1 just to make sure you know you don't accidentally make some silly mistake when you're doing the division. Uh, you might want to add them up real quick and check that. And then when you start doing the values of E, you're supposed to take N times PI. Well, N is the total number of things in your sample, and then these are the values of PI, and since these are the same, all the expected frequencies would be the same. So to get this value, I just want to take that 119 I got a moment ago, multiply that by 0.25, and I get 29.75. And, you know, which stall is that for? Stall 1, stall 2, stall 3, stall 4? Well, if the distribution was really uniform, we expect the same amount in every stall, and that same value of P will produce the same value of E in every one of these settings. So if you compared this to our previous example about the voter distribution, in that problem, they had given us a chart that said what all the um, percentages were for the different parties back in the year 2000, and we just used those as our value of PI. If you get to a problem like this one, and all you have is observed frequencies and no values of PI given, then you have to think about if HO is true, what would those values be? And in this case, if HO is true, it would be uniform use, which means equal probability, and for four categories, that means 25% apiece. And then, I would also recommend just adding that up real quick, just to make sure you didn't make any mistake there. Um, but there's four that are the same, so I could just go times four, and I get the 119 back. You should always see your sample size uh, total show up on both O and E. They should match every time. And then we want to start measuring the differences. So we have four categories. We want to do four mini-z-scores. Each one of those needs a mini-test statistic, or a mini-z-score, which would be O minus E squared over E. So I want to do that for each of the four categories, and just kind of thinking about it as I go along too. So my first um, category, stall one, I'm expecting about 29.75 people to use that if the use was uniform, but I got less uses than that, only 23. So is that a big difference? Uh, intuitively, you can think about it, like what if you're expecting 30 people to come to your party and you got 23, is that kind of close? And to me, that doesn't seem obviously close or obviously far. Let's see what it comes out as a mini test statistic. So we do the O, 23, minus the expected. We square that from here, and then we divide that by what we expected, 29.75. And it makes sense that I wasn't really sure which way to go on that, whether that was a big difference or not, because when we do the mini test statistic, we get something in the gray area, 1.532. Over 2, we would have said that's a big difference. Smaller than 1, we would have said no, and this is kind of right in the middle. So let's go on to the next one. If you're expecting third, about 30 and you get 38, that's a little bit bigger difference than last time, so it should show up a little bigger here. Um, on these, because all of my E's are the same, I can just hit second enter and just change that expected, free, or sorry, the observed frequency from 23 to 38. And when I do that, that one comes out as a bit of a bigger surprise, 
0.288 when I round it to three decimal places. What if I got 34? Well, that's not quite as far off, so that should be a smaller one. And it's not, I think, as far off as the first one, so probably even smaller than 1.5. So I change that to a 34. And yeah, that shows up as not that big of a deal, a test statistic of 0.607, or a mini test statistic, I should say. Remember, our test statistic officially is the total, so these are just kind of giving us a little bit of an intuition as to what's going on. But here you're expecting 30, you got 34. That doesn't feel like all that big of a difference. And the mini test statistic is saying, yeah, that's small enough, that could just be random variation. So on this one, we're getting uh, pretty weak evidence in support of H1. This one's fairly strong in that it's over 2. And then this is kind of middle of the road. So I'm still kind of torn as to how this goes. So we go down to the last one. What if we're expecting 30 and we get 24? That's not a real big mini test statistic either if we thought of that as being like a z-score that's kind of small pretty close to one so that seems like another difference that could be um, just due to random variation so I don't seem to be getting much um, real strong evidence here that the distribution of the use of these stalls is something other than uniform this is the one that's given me the most evidence and it's not all that strong it's over two so I would consider it somewhat strong evidence but because we have a um, kind of weakish ones and then a really weak one, I think it's not going to average out too much. So let's add it all up. 1.532 plus 2.288 and so on. And when we get the total, that's our test statistic. So our chi-squared test statistic in this case is 5.538. So then once we get our test statistic, we get onto that question of like, okay, is that enough evidence for us to be able to reject HO and to really make that decision we want to move on to our p-value so I'll do that in step four. I want to draw a right skewed shape when I'm doing a chi-square distribution and usually mention the df. Remember that the df is not n minus one but it's the number of categories minus one so one two three four categories minus one so we're going to have a df of three and that means if I drop down from the peak and move just a little bit to the right, that's my 3. And then 5 is past that, but not way past it, maybe right around here. So 5.538. And then this area to the right is going to be our p-value. Remember that all of our chi-squared tests are right-tailed tests. And definitely true for goodness of fit. So we want to figure out what that area is. And just looking at the picture, it looks kind of small. I know my picture isn't perfect. It's not telling the whole story. So honestly, I look at that at the moment, and I'm not sure if that's going to be more or less than 5%. I look over here, some strong evidence, some weak evidence. It's still kind of a mystery how this is going to go. So let's find that area. We'll use chi-squared CDF, left boundary, 5.538 to infinity with 3 degrees of freedom. So we want to put that into the calculator. That'll give the p-value for this test. So let's see how that works out. So going into the distribution menu, scrolling all the way down and on my calculator to number 8, but you want chi-squared CDF. Left boundary, 5.538. Right boundary, infinity, with 3 degrees of freedom. And it turns out to be kind of a big area, a little bigger than it looked in my picture, I think. So 0.1364. So this isn't the answer to the whole hypothesis test, but that's the moment where I know for sure what my decision is going to be. If I were to reject HO at this point, I would do so knowing that I'm taking about a 13.64% risk of making a type 1 error, and I'm only willing to go 5% on that risk. So I'm going to say, do not reject HO. And the reason I'm going to give for that is I'm going to say that that would have been too risky. And then the other interpretation of that is I'm looking at this and saying, look, I saw these differences, but they're small enough that they may have just been due to random variation. And what my p-value is telling me is that if stall use really was uniform, there'd still be a 13.64% chance of seeing differences the kind of size that we did here. And that's a reasonable chance, so that means it's reasonable that maybe HO is true. We don't know if it's true or if it's false, but based on these numbers, what we saw here is the kind of differences that are reasonable to see if 
all of these uh, expected frequencies really and truly were the same. All right, so now we just have step six left to do. We've decided uh, not to reject HO. So in step six, we're going to go ahead and write out our conclusion in words. Whenever you don't reject, that means there is not enough evidence. So I'll say there is not enough evidence. And then we always state our significance level. So at the 5% significance level, to show, and what were we trying to show? We were trying to show H1, and H1 was that the distribution of the use of the stalls is something other than uniform. So we'll go ahead and fill that in. Oops, sorry, that the distribution of the use of the stalls is something other than uniform. And again, just some reminders here. We're not saying that we know for sure that this is a uh, uniform distribution. We're just saying it's behaving reasonably like a uniform distribution would, so that's not convincing that something else is going on. Um, we're still kind of left here as a mystery as to what the distribution is, but uniform is a reasonable option, so we're not going to reject that. Not enough evidence to convince us of that. And then just uh, by the way, on this particular episode of Mythbusters, their theory was that stall number one being closest to the door would get used the most, and so they thought it would be the dirtiest stall, and they were checking it for germs and such. And it turns out if you look in our sample data, that was the least used stall. So sometimes um, you have your hypothesis, your theory about what's going on, and it might turn out to be almost op opposite of the truth. It, it looks like there's some evidence that people tend to head towards the, the middle and avoid the ends. But on the other hand, that could just be random variation and it could be uniform as well. All right, that finishes up section 10.2.